The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello there. I hope all of you can hear me. I get a thumbs up from my panelists. I think we're good. Happy Tuesday and welcome to the first webinar in a series of webinars that will address issues related to the seismic retrofit of unreinforced masonry buildings. My name is Nicholas Van, and I'm the Deputy, Historic Preservation of Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer for the Washington State Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. We've partnered with the Association for Preservation Technology, Northwest Chapter, to bring you this exciting series, originally scheduled to be an in-person event in Seattle this past May, but then 2020 happened. So here we are with all virtually. And I'm glad you're all able to join us. Unreinforced masonry buildings are common in nearly every corner of the planet, but the problems they face in terms of seismic retrofit is largely dependent upon localized geological forces and previous maintenance or lack thereof. We'll cover an array of topics related to URMs over the next few weeks. And if you're interested to view other webinars in the series or to register for future webinars, you can go to our website at www.dap.wa.gov slash URM symposium, and we'll include a link in the chat box for you. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. If you have a question during the webinar, either related to the content or a technical issue, please use the chat box to send a message to us and we'll do our best to address your question, comment, or issue. We're also happy today to provide AIA credits to those of you who have requested and paid for them. Send us a message in the chat box so we know you're here and you can email us after the webinar as well in order to get confirmation that you've attended. Today's AIA learning objectives are as follows. Today we'll learn to understand typical risks of unreinforced masonry buildings, including how buildings react during a seismic event with or without retrofitting measures. You will understand the extent of seismically vulnerable buildings throughout key large Pacific Northwest jurisdictions, Seattle and Portland. You will learn how cities are proactively addressing public safety issues by adopting policies or attempting to, to encourage seismic retrofits. And you'll also understand processes and best practices regarding permitting and historic preservation compliance for historic landmarks, specific to Seattle. The webinar today is being recorded and will be available for viewing on DAF's YouTube channel within a few weeks. Today's presentation comes from efforts in the cities of Seattle and Portland How did that get muted? Anyways. <laughs> Um, today's presentation comes from efforts in the cities of Seattle and Portland to proactively address pertinent public safety issues and to encourage the proactive retrofit of URM buildings. Planning is imperative when it comes to addressing seismic hazards of older buildings on a citywide or regionwide scale. And the next earthquake will not know whether or not we're also living through a worldwide pandemic, civil unrest, or a zombie apocalypse. So we need to be prepared, and the time to act is now. Joining us today are Matt Offwick, Jonna Papa F. The Mew, and Aaron Doherty. Matt is the Communi Community Relations Manager for the City of Seattle Office of Emergency Management. In his role, Matt is responsible for managing the office's community engagement, volunteer management, and public information programs. Prior to working for the City of Seattle, he served as a project manager for Peace Wins America, overseeing the US Vietnam Disaster Preparedness Initiative and implementing a business continuity training program in Haiphong, Vietnam. Matt previously held several positions with the Western Pennsylvania region of the American Red Cross, where he designed and implemented numerous public preparedness campaigns and served in various response roles on national and local relief operations. John Papa Estimio is Planning Policy and Community Programs Manager at the City of Portland's Bureau of Emergency Management. Since 2014, she has led the city's efforts to promote URM retrofits, including a now repealed placarding ordinance. She also manages natural hazard mitigation, operational continuity, and disaster response planning for the city. She is most proud of the Bureau's community outreach program, which includes partnerships with many culturally specific groups and the largest group of emergency response volunteers in the US. Jonna previously worked as a land use planner community organizer and policy advisor for a past Portland mayor. She has a master's in city planning from MIT and in an actual emergency, 
she is a planning section chief. And we're happy that she hears today because the governor of Oregon did declare a state of emergency yesterday. Erin Doherty is with the city of Seattle's historic preservation program within the Department of Neighborhoods. She coordinates the Landmarks Preservation Board and the Sandpoint Naval Air Station Landmark District. Ms. Doherty is a licensed architect in the state of Washington with more than 20 years of experience in historic rehabilitation and new construction in New York and Washington. And without further ado, I'll hand things over to Matt to kick us off. Ah, thank you. All right, everyone hear me now. Attempt to share my screen. Hopefully this goes seamlessly. People able to see my screen? Sure can. All right. All right, so thanks everyone for having me. Um, like Nick said, my name is Matt Offlick. I'm the Community Relations Manager with Seattle Emergency Management. So I'm going to talk about a few things today. Uh, most of the focus will be on kind of what the policy timeline looks like for Seattle in attempting to address the issue of unreinforced masonry buildings. Um, and as part of that, what kind of the inventory process looked like, what we learned from that, and then kind of a look forward of what this looks like um, moving forward. Um, COVID has complicated that a bit, but I'm actually going to start with some more introductory information since I'm the first panelist in this series. Uh, it makes sense just to give some more context on URMs and earthquake risk in general. Um, so just real quick, I mean, when we're talking about unreinforced masonry build, buildings, we're, there are some different kinds, but we're usually focused on brick buildings. So classic red brick buildings, where essentially what you have is floors are not structurally connected to walls. So they're essentially just sitting in pockets um, and parapets above roofs are also not structurally connected to the roofs. Um, so that's really what's, what's causing them to be more vulnerable um, during earthquakes. Uh, I think we shared the link to this presentation. So we do have, um, Hold on a second here. So we do have a link there to a YouTube video we have that has a lot more um, detail and kind of how to identify URMs. And we made that short tutorial to try to help other jurisdictions who are trying to do inventories. So how do they perform in earthquakes? Um, basically, the main problem and the thing we see most commonly is parapets and facades of buildings falling out into the street. Um, so you'll see that animation there is showing the parapet come off. And I'll talk a little bit in a minute about our experience during the 2001 Nisqually earthquake, which was relatively moderate, but we saw a lot of this kind of behavior. And then the concern is collapse. So that's where we actually have um, kind of that out of plane failure that they, that they call it, which is those floors are going to come out of those pockets in the walls and you can have a, a full collapse of the building. So in 2001, we had the Nisqually quake, which was a 6.8. So, and it was a deep source earthquake. So it was a relatively moderate earthquake, but we still saw the risk to URM. So during that earthquake, there was 31 buildings in the city of Seattle that were red tagged. So they were deemed not safe to enter. Of those 31, 20 were unreinforced masonry buildings. So even in a moderate quake, we saw that they were much more likely to be impacted. The pictures here of the Cadillac Hotel in the Pioneer Square neighborhood. Um, so that neighborhood was hit pretty hard and it just shows kind of what that building originally looked like in its heyday, kind of right after Nisqually in the top right and the bottom left is kind of when repairs were being made over the, the years following. Um, 
And then the bottom right is after they did a full repair and retrofit of the building. Um, so again, we saw damage even in a moderate earthquake. Next are some pictures from Christchurch, New Zealand uh, and the earthquake that they had in early 2011. And that's where we really look to for examples of what the worst case scenario could be. Um, they had a shallow quake, which we could also have here in Seattle um, and kind of right around their central business district where they have a very similar building profile to us in Seattle and large segments of that central business district were essentially destroyed. So that's kind of worst case scenario that we look. So just a little bit about the earthquake risk. I mean, this is somewhat focused on Washington, but is probably applicable to the broader kind of Pacific Northwest. Um, up there at the top, what we're always trying to highlight is there will be another earthquake. So we can look at these numbers of when we can expect to have different magnitudes of earthquake, but there will be an earthquake. And we're always trying to kind of focus on that when we look at the policy around URMs. Um, so a 12% chance that we have a 9.0 or greater in the um, next 50 years on the Cascadia subduction zone. Um, similarly, 33% chance we have an 8.0 or greater. And then those Nisqually-like deep quakes basically an 86% chance that we have another of those in 50 years. And something we also always try to highlight is, you know, people point to buildings that are still standing after the Tuolly and they're standing after our 65 earthquakes, other earthquakes. Um, that's not evidence to suggest that they will continue standing. Every time that they get some kind of shock, there's weakening that's happening that makes it more likely that they're going to have issues in the next quake, even if it is a moderate quake. And then the other thing we're always trying to highlight um, and you know work with Nick and the state on this is, is just highlighting that this is a statewide issue. So I think there's a lot of perception that this is a Seattle issue because when I get into kind of the building inventory stuff, you'll see that we have a lot of these buildings, um, but it's not just a Seattle issue. The red dots here are just showing areas of the state where we know that there are some unreinforced masonry buildings. So if you picture any town that has kind of a, a main street with older brick buildings, I mean, that's what we're talking about. So there's been some attempts to do more of a statewide survey, but it's been pretty limited. These are places we know have them because there's been some kind of recording of what's there, but there's really a need to do a, a broader statewide survey and make people realize this isn't just a Seattle. So just real quick on what this has looked like for Seattle from kind of a policy conversation. Essentially, we've been working on this for 50 years. Um, this timeline shows the, the yellow boxes are basically where there's different kind of um, ordinance measures with some projected ones toward the right there with those purple circles. Um, but there was an ordinance passed in the 70s, so in 1974, that was requiring mandatory ref retrofits to masonry buildings. Um, but by 1978, that was repealed. And a big reason for that was because there just weren't financial incentives and things in place to help building owners make those changes and make those improvements. And so there was a lot of backlash. So as we move through this process over the past eight to 10 years, um, that's been a big focus is what are ways that there can be financial incentives and ways that we can make this an easier process for building owners. Um, and then you'll see that the kind of pinkish red boxes there are all studies. We have done a lot of studies over time um, and, and each one has gotten better. And I think the one that we did in 2012, which probably ended in around 2015, hopefully hit the mark and I think we captured everything. Um, but even when we did that one, we found large swaths of the city that weren't covered by previous studies. Um, so our most recent policy effort started with the formation of a technical committee in 2008 to look at what would a standard be if we were to require retrofits. Uh, and then we had a policy committee formed in 2012 to look at what would a policy look like and how would we implement that. Um, and then those purple boxes show kind of a projected timeline from the date we would implement a policy, which we have not done yet. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more, more about that here. So when our policy committee in 2012, the first thing they wanted was just a better look at where these buildings are. And that's why we started that last kind of inventory of buildings, which really is a big first step. And it helps highlight kind of the scope of the problem and highlight other issues that might intersect from kind of the policy standpoint. So over 1,100 URMs in Seattle, that represents over 25 million square feet of building space. About 700 buildings have no visible retro thing at all. So you don't even see like rosettes on the side where maybe there was an attempt to do some bolting, um, you know, decades ago. They don't really have any sign. Um, 
Now, over 450 of the buildings have an occupant load of 100 people or more, which results in this last stat, which is there's an estimated 33,000 people in URMs in Seattle on any given day. So that really highlights the risk to life safety that's posed by these buildings. And then what really complicates the policy question is when you look at how these buildings are used and where they're located, there is intersection with a lot of other policy areas that causes complications. So 47 of these unreinforced masonry buildings are actually affordable housing and they uh, contain 2,303 affordable housing units. So the big concern there is we're in a housing crisis. There's a shortage of affordable housing. If you pass an ordinance that requires building owners to do this work, which can be expensive, will it be passed on to um, people that are renting in those buildings and then have a detrimental effect on affordable housing in those buildings? Similarly, if you look at the locations of the buildings, um, you know the darker areas are areas that have a higher percentage of people of color. And you'll notice that the neighborhoods where we have these, the U district, um, some of these places in like our Belltown, Pioneer Square, Capitol Hill areas, they are the places where there's a higher percentage of people of color. So would they be, you know, more impacted by something that resulted in higher rents? Similarly, when we look at poverty, you'll see the same thing. Places with a higher percentage of people below 200% of the poverty level, we have more of those buildings. Um, you know, the issue with this and what we're always trying to highlight is, Yes, there could be, if not implemented correctly, some negative impacts to certain populations by having a policy, but we can guarantee that there will be negative impacts to populations if we don't have a policy. If certain populations are more likely to be living in these buildings, if these buildings contain affordable housing and they collapse or are damaged beyond repair, then that is also going to have, you know, detrimental effects on these groups. So it's kind of how do we balance those things? And then similarly, historic preservation, um, you know, 380 of the URMs are either in some historic district or are historic landmarks that are registered. So there's also just this community character aspect and historic preservation. And, and that is something that we want to keep in mind. If, if these buildings are gone, then they're gone. There's, there's no getting them back. That's just another kind of added, added element when looking at policy options. So what does the technical recommendation actually look like? So the, the policy committee in 2017 gave their full policy recommendation. And, and if you went to this presentation, you could go to the link down here and read the full report. Um, I'm not the technical person, to, but to put it quite simply, I think the key point is star there that the technical standard does not bring buildings up to code. The, the real goal is life safety. So it's how do we do collapse prevention and save lives? And so that really ends up being a few things here. It's parapets being braced. So the numbers on the left here coincide to some of the elements in the image over here. Parapets being braced to roofs, floors and roofs being structurally connected to URM walls, and then out of plane bracing. So these um, kind of beams that you see here on the wall. So those are the four main elements of what would go into what is called a bolts plus standard. So it's it's below what normal code would require if you were building a new building, uh, but it's really aimed at protecting life safety. And then a big part of the policy, I mean, that's what a building owner would have to do. And there are some caveats to that. And Aaron will speak to some of this with the historic preservation side. Um, the other big part of the policy is a phased approach to implementation, um, which we hope takes a lot of burden off of people. And what we did was break buildings into risk categories, and I'll go through those. You'll notice that we have no low risk category because we don't, we do not believe that any URM is a low risk. Uh, so the first category is critical risk. So these are schools and critical facilities. So schools, daycares, hospitals, fire stations, shelters, and this is 77 buildings. So it's a it's a relatively small number out of that over 1,100. Uh, and you kind of see the timeline there, which is with each risk category, there's a different timeline for implementation. So basically year zero is policy has been passed, law has been passed, building owner has been notified. From the date they're notified, you'll see some different milestones for when they have to have an assessment, when they have to apply for a permit, and then finally when they actually have to have it completed. So for these critical risk buildings, they have a total of seven years from the time they're notified when they would have to have 
And it is worth saying that in the assessment phase, we may find that some of these actually meet the standard. Um, a lot of Seattle public schools have been retrofitted as part of their capital improvement planning over the years. Um, there's just never been a need for like a city assessment to make sure that they met some retrofit criteria because there's not been any mandatory, mandatory retrofit criteria. So the number really could be smaller than 77. The second group is high risk. So these are buildings that are greater than three stories or they're on poor soil. Um, let's see if this loads here. Hopefully it'll all load in a second here, but um, there's 183 buildings that fall into the high risk category. And we define poor soil by our Department of Construction Inspections environmentally critical areas. So areas prone to liquefaction, potential wide sl landslide areas um, and steep slope areas. And then also buildings that have 100 occupants or more in an assembly space. Um, so this, this is 183 buildings, so larger than the critical. And then you'll see the timeline is a little different. It's a total of 10 years from the date that you're notified. And then the last category is medium. The vast majority of buildings fall into the medium category. Uh, and what the goal really was here is it, we're hoping that the vast majority of buildings have a much longer timeline to actually complete work, um, which should make it easier from both a financial standpoint and just a logistical standpoint. Um, you'll see a total of 13 years for medium risk buildings, which make up the vast majority of buildings that they would have to actually complete the retrofit. So where are we at now? Um, I mean, that is the gist of the policy as it was proposed. It's kind of that bolts plus standard with a phased approach for implementation based on risk category. Prior to COVID-19, there was a lot of work going on around this um, and our Department of Construction Inspections was working with the mayor and city council. And there was a plan to have a joint resolution to actually begin implementing a mandatory URM upgrade program. That is now uncertain. Um, that was scheduled to happen at the beginning of 2020. Um, as Nick mentioned, 2020 wasn't all that cooperative, as we all know. So with new budget constraints and new priorities, it's kind of to be seen where that goes now. Um, and there have to be some regrouping on that because there are city costs to it. Um, you know, one of the plans was to have actual staff at SDCI who can kind of serve as liaisons to building owners who have to do this work. And that's something we learned from places like San Francisco that have implemented similar programs. Uh, but one thing that does continue to happen is our Department of Construction and Inspections is monitoring changes to national seismic codes, because we know that by the time we implement something, we very well may have to update that technical standard based on what was put down on paper in 2017. Uh, and then the big thing is following some financing um, mechanisms. So a big part of the work we did kind of toward the end of 2018, 2019 was to identify ways that there could be tax incentives and other kind of programs that could help cover some of the load from a financial standpoint for building owners. Uh, and I think you guys have Chuck Depew from the National Development Council on a, a future webinar, maybe in December. And we contracted with them in 2019 to really look at what funding mechanisms would exist for the city of Seattle and make some recommendations on what made the most sense. Um, so you can probably hear more about that at a later session. Uh, but a big one we've been follow following is C-PACER financing. So commercial property assessed clean energy and resilience. Um, so there was a state house bill passed, I think, in June of 2020 or May, um, which basically gave counties the right to set up these kinds of programs, which they did not have before. And this could really be really big for helping building owners fund URM retrofits because it basically lets them borrow money against the assessed property value. And so the money they borrow to the to make the improvements stays with the building rather than staying with the owner. Um, which is something that would allow them to kind of pay it off over a much longer period of time than they would with normal finance. So, so that's something we're following closely as we hope that King County makes some movements on that in the near future. Um, and then if you're able to access the online version, just some, some links I put in here for additional information. There's our Department of Construction Inspections URM page, which has just a ton of documentation on kind of our policy development process and other things. 
Um, the full building inventory is on there. And then Shift Zero is an organization that's really been leading the CPACER effort in Washington state. And they have a, little, a lot of good resources on there and the whole toolkit they've actually built to make it easy for counties just to adopt a CPACER ordinance with some documents that they've come up with and they've had kind of thorough legal review around them that should be easy for people to just kind of take and, and run with. And that's, that's all I have. Great, thank you so much, Matt. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, we will have a session in December, I uh, can't remember the specific date off the top of my head, where we will be talking about financial incentives, both existing incentives as well as those that uh, maybe don't exist, but you know, we're looking for ideas, especially in Washington, where we don't have a state tax credit program, um, you know, similar to a lot of other states that uh, have that ability, but um, you know, we have the federal historic tax credit program here. We have special tax valuation, which is a property tax, abatement, um, but we're really lacking in terms of uh, more localized incentives for being able to solve this issue. So we're gonna hand it over to John now. Muted myself. Oh, I'm unmuted. Awesome, thank there you. you. Go. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is John Papa Femu. Uh, I work, uh, as was said, at the City Portland Bureau of Emergency Management. Uh, it, uh, where I wear many hats, but among them, I have been running the city's uh, URM retrofit program since uh, since 2014 uh, into this year, and I'm presenting on it now. Um, it's recently, uh, the committee that I was supervising last month was uh, sadly dissolved by the city council, a victim of the pandemic and other uh, a series of unfortunate events. So I've added a subtitle to my presentation. Um, but what I'd like to talk to you about today is um, to briefly go over our URM inventory in Portland, which is in many ways probably parallel to uh, uh, Seattle's situation. Um, talk a little bit about how we develop the inventory in case there are folks from other jurisdictions that are thinking about taking that on. Um, briefly, where uh, the seismic code is in the city of Portland, which is um, a, a bit stronger than the state of Oregon as a whole, not much. I'll talk about mostly about our policy efforts to require mandatory retrofits, which uh, so far have not been successful. Um, also about placarding, which is something we tried for a minute and uh, didn't work either, sort of for a combination of legal and political reasons. And then finally, some uh, lessons learned or what we would do differently next time, if there is a next time for us, uh, which is today's election day. And uh, it's at least in the city of Portland, totally possible that on January 1st, there will be nobody on the city council who was there the last time I talked to them about URMs in 2018. So anything is possible. But um, so the situation with URMs in Portland, um, we think we have about 1,650 URMs, not including single family homes. Um, we arrived at that inventory uh, originally through um, a visual survey that went um, street, uh, street by street in every neighborhood in Portland that has structures constructed before 1964, which is uh, when the building code stopped allowing unreinforced masonry in the city. It was done by a combination of city employees and graduate students at Portland State University, supervised by an engineering professor there. They did paper um, surveys um, that ended up in uh, a basement uh, in boxes. And then in 2014, when we took on the issue of URMs again, uh, a registered professional engineer and an assistant basically went through every paper survey and cross-checked it against our permit database to see if it had been upgraded or demolished. Um, they also compared it with Google Street View and then flagged buildings that didn't seem to match up with the info. They checked those and then they did uh, also kind of spot checks on the rest of the inventory. The result was about 300 buildings came off mostly because of demolitions. A few others turned out to not be URMs, but they also added some when they did the street surveys. So, um, so altogether, that's where we think we're at now. Um, that's 9% of the commercial buildings in the city of Portland, and it includes about 7,200 residential units, of which about 1,800 are publicly subsidized affordable housing and a few hundred more are what we would call naturally occurring affordable housing, so low rent buildings. The average building is 90 years old and about 567 of them have some flavor of historic designation. Less than 100 are actually on the National Historic Register as individual structures, but many more contributing structures in National Historic Districts or their contributing structures on our local inventory. Um, this is just slicing the inventory in a different way, but I guess uh, on the plus side for us, more than half the buildings are just one story. So there's a lot of sort of 
CMU block storage buildings and garages, stuff like that, that pose relatively less risk because they are not as tall and have lower occupancy. Um, on the minus side, 7% of them are four or more stories tall. There's some really enormous URMs downtown. Um, the majority of them are commercial buildings, a commercial like retail, office, uh, storage. Um, they're about 250 um, multifamily buildings, as I mentioned. Um, there's also, unfortunately, a number of unreinforced masonry schools and community centers, uh, some of which belong to the city. The city owns itself 41 URM buildings, as we found in our inventory, and then the others are mostly um, institutional buildings. Right now, uh, the code requirements for the city of Portland are when you re-roof a building um, and you do 50% or more of the roof, you have to brace the parapets and tie the roof to the walls. Um, people sometimes skate on that requirement, actually it seems often, um, because they get a permit to do 48% of the roof and then they come back and get a permit to do the other 48%. Somehow the whole building gets re-roofed and they never do any seismic work. Um, it's also true that uh, a pitfall that we found that other jurisdictions might also experience is we bundle roof permits. So a re-roofing company can pull 10 permits at once and send in the addresses later. And sometimes when they do that uh, in the past, they uh, they re-roofed URM buildings and it was inspected and approved before we even knew it. Um, for something greater than just that minimum parapet bracing and wall uh, roof ties, uh, it hit, happens when the work meets a dollar trigger of uh, cost per square foot, um, when they increase the occupancy load by 150 or more, or when the building moves from a higher hazard class. So if it goes from uh, in the industrial space to it's repurposed as a performance space and it has much higher occupancy than for instance they would have to they would have to retrofit it um the result of the current code is pretty limited success um five percent of our urms have been fully upgraded since we did the original inventory in 96. um those are if you i don't know how well you can see from the map but primarily um those are downtown buildings that are the sort of larger um, more fabulous structures where that proved economically feasible. And then just 4% um, have done that partial upgrade. Those are the ones that we roofed and braced the parapet. Um, so given all this information about how many URMs we have, how they're used, um, and the risks that they present that Matt's already spoken to us about, and also um, given other events of the last decade, the Tohoku earthquake in 2011 that put a lot of tsunami debris on Oregon shores and brought the earthquake risk to our attention, the Oregon Resilience Report that came out in 2013 and really highlighted the massive seismic risks in Oregon, the New Yorker article that came out in 2015, that was a really big one. Oregon Public Broadcasting did a series about it. We got a lot of coverage in the local paper and the news weeklies. We felt like the window was open, that people cared about this issue and that there was an opportunity to do some mandatory retrofits. Um, so we set about um, in a process that, start, that uh, comprised three committees, the first of which convened in 2014. Um, it was uh, appointed by the city commissioners. Um, each uh, city office got to appoint some people um, and they uh, were architects and engineers and they really looked at best practices domestically and also um, internationally and based on their professional expertise, recommended what they felt were reasonable standards for retrofitting URM buildings. Um, they took about uh, eight months to do that work, and they passed the torch to a new committee that, again, was appointed by um, our city council, and that um, were uh, commercial lenders, uh, real estate developers, uh, folks who worked in the business of real estate and understood how retrofits were financed. They made recommendations for financial supports that would make the recommended retrofits possible. And then they passed those recommendations to a policy committee um, that was intended to be kind of a conference committee that would pull together the technical standards and the um, and the financial need and make a, a consolidated suite of recommendations to the city council. We optimistically thought that process would take 18 months. In fact, it took almost four years for them to reach um, recommendations and those came to city council originally in June of 2018. These standards, um, I'll just flash out at you, were um, similar to the approach in Seattle. We put buildings in categories. We had a high standard for critical buildings and essential facilities, of which there are only about eight or URMs. Um, we wanted those to go to immediate occupancy. 
Um, then for schools and community centers, those buildings that we believe we would rely upon to reoccupy relatively quickly after an earthquake it would be part of our strategy for recovery. We wanted to go to a damage control standard, uh, which is the safety that could take up to 20 years. And then for pretty much all other commercial buildings, the standard that uh, was originally reached as a compromise in the committee was what we called collapse risk reduction. It was a prescriptive standard, so there was no performance standard. It just said the building owners would have to brace the parapets, tie the walls to the roof, and re-sheath the roof. So it was, for some buildings, one story, you know, really regularly shipped buildings might still provide a good level of benefit, but for many of those three RMs it was pretty minimal improvement. Um, even that was really hotly contested at city council. Um, and so as a result, the ultimate recommendations uh, or requirements of the Portland City Council were, they um, required the retrofits to the public safety buildings, the schools and the community centers, and they asked the Bureau of Development Service Building Department to come back with building code to implement that. That so far hasn't happened for a variety of political reasons and also them uh, now the pandemic and them just being overwhelmed, I think, with their minimum amount of work. And then for the rest, they created a new committee um, that was the committee that I was staffing until last month um, that was to address privately owned buildings and was to seek to provide uh, voluntary supports to building owners to promote retrofits to meet or exceed the proposed standard um, and it was really intended to support building owners to achieve retrofits. And they met a few times um, in 2019 and 2020, and then the pandemic interrupted things. And um, at this point, it seems at least for emergency management, we don't have capacity to continue that work, uh, nor does it at this point have political support. Um, the other thing Portland City Council did uh, in 2018, uh, recognizing that they weren't achieving the high standard of mandatory retrofits that had initially been hoped for, is they required us to port uh, warning signs on all URM buildings that, um, that said this is an unreinforced masonry building, it may be unsafe in the event of a major earthquake. It was a model on a California state law, it was very similar, in fact, almost identical in terms of the language. Um, it was immediately challenged in court, really before even when just a few placards had gone up. Um, and in a legal stunner from the city standpoint, we lost an initial injunction on First Amendment grounds, uh, not because it um, was it was compelled speech, um, it was not unlawful for the city to require building owners to post uh, signs, but the, um, the building owners were successful in calling into question the validity of our inventory. And basically the court said we couldn't enforce the placarding until we did a lot more work to show that our inventory was strong. Um, being familiar with the data and how it was developed, I and many others in the city felt like we could have fought this one and won it. But again, because it was so politically unpopular and um, our opponents seem to have the determination and resources to drag the court fight out for a long time, the city council opted to repeal the requirement rather than take that on. Um, also in terms of the policy work that was accomplished, we lobbied at the state level for um, authorizing legislation that allows local or jurisdictions to do a tax exemption to offset the cost of uh, your own retrofits. So there's a lot of detail there, but basically we could give people a tax exemption, but we haven't implemented it in the city because we've been unable to negotiate with the school district and the county to forego the revenue. They would also forego revenue to support that program and that negotiation has not been fruitful. Um, we brought forward state grants to retrofit URMs. Um, for not-for-profits and uh, particularly not-for-profits in historic structures. That was uh, successful in committee at the Emergency Preparedness Committee, but it never got past Ways and Means. And I think in that regard, we suffered as also perhaps Seattle does from a perception that URMs are a city problem or Portland problem, although we know that's not the case. And in fact, a lot of small towns in Oregon that have a downtown historic district that's kind of their tourism lifeblood or the heart of their city, there's a lot of URMs there but um, that wasn't compelling in Salem, so that did not move forward. And then, uh, I, it's not on the slide, but since CPACE was mentioned, we also did implement CPACE in Portland. Um, the, it's modeled on the tax benefits and the financing program for, um, for energy retrofits. We haven't seen a lot of uptake in it, although it's been open for two years now, and I think that what we're struggling with is that the payoff in terms of an energy retrofit is really clear because there are 
annual savings that you can put towards paying it off and for there are potentially tremendous savings also in seismic retrofitting, but it's kind of a 1,000% payoff or no payoff if the earthquake doesn't happen. And so um, even with the availability of the program, we've only done a couple loans. Um, there were some other ideas uh, that maybe, again, will be discussed in future, but a shared appreciation mortgage where the city would take on partial ownership of URM buildings and, in, and front the cost of the retrofit in exchange and then get our money back from the building sold. Um, and also a thought that we could subsidize loans, which we've done in other instances, or that we could not manage the loan program, but buy down the interest rate and let a commercial lender manage it. Um, those all had potential, but because the committee's been dissolved, probably we won't have the opportunity to pursue them. So why did the committee get dissolved and uh, why are we so stuck at this moment? Well, I think that uh, this juxtaposition of these three newspaper articles really wonderfully illustrates kind of the evolution of public discourse around this issue. Um, we started out in a strong position. People had a lot of thought about earthquake. It was in the news. Mercury, which is uh, in, in CS, owned by the same folks that published The Stranger in Seattle, um, was I felt like it was really helping us. Portland's old brick buildings will kill you. Um, Portland's comically underprepared for seismic doom, 1,640 buildings are especially dicey, like that really there was a lot of media attention to that. Then you can see like uh, a year later, Willamette Week says, when the big one hits, hundreds of Portland buildings could crumble, but is it fair to make property owners prepare? And then finally, you know, right before uh, this all ended, the Northwest Examiner, which is not ever a friend of the show for the city, top heavy seismic program may crush small owners. So really the pendulum swung from being about public safety and, and seismic risk to being about the property rights and the expense of, of doing retrofits and the, the safety argument really just totally dropped out of the discussion. Um, we like to think that we had a benefit in terms of engendering increased public awareness about the risks of URMs. Um, we definitely also uh, brought on a lot of public protest, and most notably, um, the NAACP weighed in on the issue. Uh, there are eight historically black churches in Portland, we believe, that are URMs, and um, and and that really engaged uh, the NAACP and others in, in in Portland's communities of colors about this issue. So, wow, what did we learn from all that? I think that. Uh, for us, key takeaways were first, um, we, 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 we were tone deaf to history, I guess is the way I might say it. We, we, did not, we started out this policy with good intentions and with the knowledge that absolutely historically underserved communities and, and communities that still experience racism and oppression will be most badly impacted in an earthquake as they are in every disaster and as we currently see now during COVID. But what we didn't recognize was also that Portland's history of land use planning, which is really mirrored across the United States, is one of redlining, restrictive real estate covenants, uh, redevelopment that disproportionately displaced communities of color, and then after all that gentrification that also disproportionately displaced historic communities of color. And so communities that had been harmed by so many racist planning practices of the past, and this was one more program that was a requirement that those communities could not afford. And so if we had centered our work truly in support to those communities and, um, and had a plan to provide support to the neediest owners, then I think that we would have retained the moral high ground and we could have had allies in communities where we really needed them and where it was in the interest arguably of the communities that we served. And because we did not do that, what happened was, in my opinion, many um, building owners of means, people that are affluent, hotels, high rent URM buildings, hid behind uh, the fairness argument that really wasn't theirs to make, um, but that all the building owners um, sort of grouped themselves together. And we didn't have a program to help anybody, so we, we were not in a strong position to dispute that argument. I think we also failed to set out a really clear process at the beginning. We were trying to incorporate a lot of considerations. We were learning as we were going, but as a result, we had a lot of debate about who, how people got on the committee and what, who set the agenda. And the argument became about the process and not about the issue itself. 
And then finally, as I said, um, this discussion also really became about the costs and, and property rights and the concern for public safety was lost, even though that was the reason that we started the project in the beginning. So, um, so those are all things that we would hope to address if we had a chance to go back and do it again. Um, and in the meantime, if you are doing this work in your own jurisdiction, I hope you will be in touch with me, right, call. Um, and uh, we would, in the city of Portland, would be delighted to see Seattle or another city move forward on this because I think that we all need good models for, um, for how this can work and that that will help other cities to follow the lead and learn. And Thank that's you so it for much. my presentation. Thank you so much, Jonna. That's uh, an incredible amount of work that um, you have been able to do and also the city of Seattle has been able to do um, through Matt. So uh, we're gonna hand it over now to Aaron Doherty uh, with the city of Seattle Department of Neighborhoods. Um, and just a reminder to you all, if you have a question, uh, cause we're running just a little bit behind on time uh, to use the chat box or the uh, Q and A um, function, and we will do our best to answer them either in the chat chat box or in the question box. Okay, I've been unmuted. Um, can you hear me? Sure can. Okay, and can you see my full screen? Yes, you're good to go. Okay, great. Thank you, Nicholas. So. Um, I think I'm gonna, I'll turn my camera on. If, um, if I have bandwidth issues, please let me know and I will uh, turn that off. So um, as Nicholas said, I coordinate the Landmarks Preservation Program with the city of Seattle, uh, as well as one of the city's eight historic districts. And my slides are not advancing, here we go. So um, I co the, coordinate the um, Sandpoint Naval Air Station, but there are seven other districts in the city, uh, Pioneer Square, Pike Place Market, Ballard Avenue, the Chinatown International District, Columbia City, Harvard Belmont, and Fort Lawton. So today I'm going to speak to the type of reviews that I do for individually landmarked buildings, and there are several hundred in the city. Uh, Sarah Sote, the city preservation officer, is also a coordinator for landmarks. Um, and this is when we are looking at proposed seismic upgrades today, um, sort of independent of what BOLTS plus policy may look like. Uh, this is our practice currently, and is generally um, it's generally done in a similar fashion to the historic districts, but there may be some nuanced differences depending on the designated features of an individual landmark versus the guidelines of a specific district. So our current practice is for the staff to review the proposal as part of in-kind maintenance and repair, rather than as a paid certificate of approval or C of A application, which would require a uh, review and approval by the relevant board or commission. These are, however, some instances uh, where an aspect of a proposed seismic project could require a certificate of approval because the proposal would fundamentally alter designated features. So I'll discuss some common scenarios, how we prefer to see them addressed, and then some more unusual circumstances. Uh, today's symposium is specifically about unreinforced masonry buildings, but it's important to remember there is a potential for other construction types um, or design scenarios that would require seismic improvement in a building. So um, we do see some property owners who are electing to do this just out of caution for their property um, and others where it is being required by Seattle Department of Construction Inspections as a result of making substantial alterations to an existing building. So um, tying floors and roofs to exterior walls uh, has historically been done through um, with through wall anchors uh, and many times um, say in Pioneer Square or the Chinatown International District you can see these visible at the exterior face of a building and you're seeing the tie as well as the bearing plate or rosette um, but it's becoming very common to see an alternate approach to use epoxied anchors at the interior and so um, you'll see that we have um, an example here, this is uh, the former fire station 23, where um, there are anchors that are coming from the interior of the building and not coming and being exposed at the exterior. 
so this has been this we see this quite common um, but we do know that there are exceptions um, sorry to go forward um, here's an example this is the Highland Apartments uh, these pro the property owner knew they had an unreinforced masonry building but they didn't realize that it wasn't a conventional brick masonry building so um, the photo on the right is showing um, a hollow clay tile um, interlocking block that is the construction of this building with a true um, brick veneer on the facade. So when the um, design team approached us to talk about this, we were looking at um, what are the alternatives um, that you may need to uh, study. And so, let me go back. So we agreed with them that it was appropriate to do a through wall anchor um, for this building because there's no pullout strength um, trying to use the, the hollow clay tile uh, for that resistance. So what became important was making sure that the anchors um, were laid out in a um, symmetrical and sort of clear pattern, um, avoiding architectural features on the buildings, um, like some of the decorative um, shields up by the parapet, um, and then also to look at um, laying these out in a way that um, was minimally visually obtrusive, um, but also we find that it's also uh, preferential to paint the ties and bearing plates either a neutral color or one that could help blend in um, with the background rather than a contrasting color. We also find that it's preferable um, to take a similar approach to bracing parapets, if that's possible, um, where you're using hidden anchors. Here's an example at University of Washington. Um, in this case, you're also seeing where they're, um, they're tying the copings down to the wall, and in this case, at a, at a sloped roof. Um, similar detail on the right, uh, where the coping stones have been drilled out and doweled, and then um, non-shrink mortar used to protect the sky facing um, penetration. And then on the left, um, the design team proposed with the decorative finials on the building to carefully remove those, drill them out, and then reinstall them back over an, a, a mortar dowel. And see there's some other examples from University of Washington this is um, a far more robust parapet um, and therefore bracing that's um, with three three different fasteners um, per strut uh, and again um, trying to um, carefully reattach the coping in a way that will survive um, seismic event and also the bracing here um, a nice approach trying to minimize the number of penetrations made in the roof. And then at Savory Hall, um, I provide this one as an example because they have an unusual sort of stepped gable uh, parapet where they're using strong backs. And then um, a large architectural feature that doweling alone wasn't going to be sufficient uh, to protect it. So they've gone in and tethered that to the roof um, or sort of lassoed it in, in place. So for lateral improvements, um, brace frames are quite common. And while our hope is to avoid crossing windows with braces, we also know it's very difficult to avoid doing that. So we look to mitigate their appearance by um, having them painted a darker color. And you can see um, with the Butnik building, there are struts crossing the windows beyond um, <clears throat> the first and second stories, but they don't really detract from the character and um, don't uh, draw attention to themselves. So um, in addition to that, we'd also, you know, like to look at what is the composition of the braces. So uh, in the case of the OK Hotel, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a symmetrical entry where you have a, um, you have a recessed entry flanked by storefronts, and so the bracing was introduced in a symmetrical pattern uh, to try and balance that out. I thought that was a, a good solution. In terms of shear walls, um, another common uh, lateral component that's introduced as part of seismic improvements 
Um, these can typically be accommodated at the interior of a building, but we do know that there are unusual scenarios. And again, I'm returning to the Highland Apartments um, as an example. And in this case, because of the um, unique terracotta block construction, uh, the engineer had determined that in addition to making um, introducing shear walls at the interior, they wanted to introduce a, a new concrete wall at the exterior of the building along the entire rear facade. So um, this is something that the Landmarks Board did review and approve. And they felt that because it was a tertiary facade and that the building had so many challenges um, with this unique construction uh, type, they did approve this. So um, they did speak at length about the um, finished appearance of the wall and how that would relate to the stucco um, courtyard spaces on that same side of the building and that it was compatible with the language of the building. So, um, and then in terms of introducing diaphragms to the building, um, when contemplating where to install those, um, many times we're considering which side of an assembly is better to preserve. In the case of walls, sometimes that's an easy decision unless you have a double-sided shear wall. Um, but many times it comes down to looking at the um, looking at the floor or ceiling assemblies. And I'll just go back one to the OK Hotel, where um, example on the right, they did have a decorative ceiling in that retail space, that tin, pressed tin ceiling that they wanted to preserve, but they also wanted to restore the um, fur floors up above. So in this case, they removed the removed the tin ceiling, abated it, and reinstalled it after making the um, diaphragm improvements above. So lastly, I'll just speak to chimneys. Um, you know, many folks would prefer to shorten them if they are still in use um, or to remove them entirely if they're no longer in service. But if it's a character defining feature of the building, our preference is for you to explore alternatives. Um, Bracing is very common. I know many times this is not, um, a structural engineer wouldn't want this to be their preferred method, um, but it is still quite common and usually um, more affordable. And in this case, uh, this is an example of the University of Washington Eagleson Hall. And at the south side of this building, there was a more utilitarian chimney that we did allow them to shorten. But in the case of the two um, distinct architectural chimneys near the north and southeast corners, um, they propose to brace them. And there is an existing system in place, um, but the current, uh, the structural engineer for the current rehabilitation project determined that this was not sufficient. And so they are increasing the size of the struts and also um, uh, raising where those meet the chimney and the strong back and tying that into the ridge of the building uh, the ridge of the roof on this end of the building where they're making additional um, structural improvements. Uh, this is another good example. This is the Queen Anne branch um, of the Seattle Public Library. This is a beautiful uh, brick masonry and terracotta um, chimney that's on the back of the building, so many folks don't see it um, regularly unless they're in the back parking. Um, and bracing it, there wasn't really a good opportunity to do that um, because of the layout and the roof. So um, the design team pro proposed to um, disassemble the existing historic chimney and salvage all of the components and rebuild a new um, CMU flue that they've reclad in the um, original materials and matching details. And so the Landmarks Board reviewed this because it was not especially in-kind maintenance and repair, but reconstruction, and they thought it was a clever solution and approved this. And then lastly, I'll just show um, the heroic supply laundry chimney um, where the design team had proposed to create a whole interior frame um, and system of reinforcing as well as improving the foundation of the chimney um, in order to maintain it. And then lastly, um, for anyone who does work in Seattle, um, I just want to let people know that we, in the last six weeks, have um, changed our application process and we've moved online. 
and we're now using the Seattle Services Portal on um, the Department of Construction and Inspections website uh, for submittals of certificates of approval. So if you are submitting um, a project to us, you would be doing it that way. And if we determined that the work was consistent with in-kind maintenance and repair, um, we would notif notify you of that determination and we would not assign a fee to the application. So that is it for me. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, and perfect timing, because we're right at time. Um, we don't have any outstanding questions, it looks like, that came in through the chat or the Q&A. So I will close this out. I will send a link to our website where you can register for future webinars. And thank you all for joining us and hope you can all join us for future webinars in the series. Thank you and happy election day. Thank you, Nicholas. Thanks, Nick. Thank you.